was the director of a recovery home. And those two things, and it was all men, and those two things I always told my guys. Two things that constantly got our guys in trouble and kicked out and really just derailing their recovery. And it was relationships and money. Does that sound familiar? And the reason that got them in trouble is because when, when you first get sober, you should really be focusing on your recovery. When you first start battling those sins that have destroyed your life for years, your sole focus should be a relationship with God and the recovery life that you're trying to build. But Satan loves to tempt us to look away from God. Remember when Satan was tempting Jesus in the desert? And the first temptation he gave him was, he said, make those stones into bread. Remember, Jesus was fasting. Now, it would not have been sinful for Jesus to make those stones into bread. He could have done so. It would not have been sinful for him to eat them. But here's what Satan was trying to get him to do. He's trying to take something good and distract him from God. He's trying to get him to break his fast and take his eyes off of the Lord with even something that would be considered good. And here's what I'm trying to say to you. Relationships money these things will all come they're all good but listen the devil can use these things to derail your recovery in a second and some of you right now you're pursuing relationships that probably are no good for you and they're taking your eyes off of what you need to be looking at and that is christ listen all those things will come if you make first things first seek first his kingdom And all these things will be added to you. But if you try to go and get these things right away, i got to get back all the money. i got to get back all the possessions. i got to get back all my relationships. I'm going to go and get in a relationship with this girl or this guy. And guess what? Your eyes have been taken off the Lord. And soon your recovery is going to suffer. And if your recovery suffers, what happens? You go back into what you were doing. So just take that as a little nugget of wisdom, a word of advice tonight. Focus on Christ. And that's what we're going to do as we look at Mark chapter 1. Take out your papers you've been given. We're still in the gospel of Mark because we want to continue to set our eyes upon Jesus. We want to continue to look at the Lord Jesus Christ and, and focus upon him because he is our recovery. He is our salvation. He's the one who is going to give us power to live new lives. And the more we know about him, the Bible says, the more power we're going to have to live a life of godliness. Did you know that? That the more you know about Jesus and the more you know Jesus, the more you're going to have in terms of your ability to live a new life in Christ. So Mark chapter 1, we're going to read a story about Jesus, just another day in the life of Christ. He first heals Peter's mother-in-law and then basically heals the entire town he's in. And what I want you to see from this is what Mark is trying to show you is that all these claims that Jesus is making about himself and all these claims that the Bible's making about himself are true. They're true and they're being proven tonight in a passage like this where Jesus is demonstrating the power of God, particularly in his ability to heal. So look with me. Mark chapter 1, verse 29. It says, And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew. With James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Let's pray together. Father and our God, we're so thankful that in Christ it is well with our souls. There's been an atonement made, a sacrifice made on our behalf that no matter what happens in this life, what trials may come, what assaults we may receive from the devil, God, we know it is well with our souls if we have Christ. Our sins are forgiven and we have right standing with God. Unless, of course, Lord, there are some here who haven't trusted Christ, and it is not well with their souls. They're still underneath your wrath and condemnation if you have yet to come to know Jesus. And I pray tonight you would draw them by your spirit to know Christ. 
Lord, I pray it help me preach this passage and help me to relate it to the people's lives before me. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Who is Jesus Christ? Who do you think Jesus Christ is? I can promise you there is no more important question that you will have to answer than who is Jesus Christ. And listen, wherever you're at in your life, you're never neutral. You'll never walk away from a question like that and think, well, I'll just deal with that later. No, you've already dealt with that question then. Unless you have bowed the knee to Christ, then you are in rebellion against him. And here's what I want you to see is that Christ has given us more than sufficient reason to believe that he's Lord. In fact, C.S. Lewis, he said that there's, there's one of three conclusions that you must come to when it comes to Jesus. You must either believe that Jesus was a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. Maybe you've heard this argument. And what Lewis is saying is this, is that there's, there's really no other conclusion that you can come to. You, you must either think that Jesus was the biggest liar on the face of the earth, or that he was crazy, or that he is who he said he is. Actually, listen to what Lewis says in his own words. He says, I'm trying to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. And here's what people often say. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I do not accept his claim to be God. I worked with a girl like this one time. They were her and her family are from a different country they adhere to a different religion and I was just coming to know Jesus and I just asked her I said what do you think about Christ what's your family think about Christ and they said well we think he's a really good man we think he's a great moral teacher he taught a lot of spiritual truth and here's what Lewis is saying you can't say that about Jesus you cannot reduce Jesus down to just a good man because good men don't claim to be God Lewis goes on to say this This is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on level with a man who says he is a poached egg. Lewis was British. Or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord. But let us not patronize him with the nonsense about his being a great moral teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Again, here's what Lewis is saying. When you read the Bible and you look at Jesus and you see what he did and the claims that he made, there's no way you can walk away and say, okay, here's what I think about Jesus. He was a really good guy. Like he was really spiritual and he taught really cool things, kind of like a a Gandhi, you know, or, or a Buddha. Or maybe on par with like a Mother Teresa, something like that. Like, you can't do that with Jesus. So you have to do one of three things. You have to say, well, he's a liar. He, he lied about those claims. Or you have to say he was crazy. He, he didn't know what he was talking about. And he was just mad. Or you must come to the conclusion that Jesus is Lord. And here's why I think that you should believe that Jesus is Lord. Because he proved That he is God in the flesh. You say, how did he do that? Through the countless eyewitness testified miracles that Jesus performed over and over and over again. Jesus didn't do these miracles in isolation on some controlled environment like a lot of these fake healers that we're going to talk about here in a moment. Jesus over and over and over again performed miracle after miracle for thousands to see until he performed the greatest miracle of his ministry which was getting up from the dead and so Jesus confronts us with the reality of his lordship and what Mark has shown us tonight in this passage is that his miracles prove who he is So last week, you remember the story we read about Jesus, verse 21 to 28. Jesus was in the synagogue. He's teaching like no one has ever taught before. And all of a sudden, this guy in the synagogue, right, he just starts crying out because he has a demon. And Jesus silences him, casts out the demon. What we're being told there is that he has power over the devil. He has power over the demonic. And he demonstrated that power by casting out the demon. And so... Remember, the synagogue service is on a Saturday, it was on the Sabbath, and it's still that same day. If you look at your passage, pull out your passage of Scripture on that piece of paper, it says in verse 29, And immediately he left the synagogue 
entered the house of Simon and Andrew and James and John. So it's still the same day, Saturday, the Jewish synagogue service, the church service is over. They're leaving church and they're going to go to Peter's house, probably to have a meal. This is most likely where Jesus lived. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He was raised in Nazareth, but he most likely during his ministry lived in Capernaum with Peter. And Peter, he lived right near the synagogue. In fact, to this day, you could go to Israel, to the town of Capernaum, and you could find the house of Peter. It's it's a tourist location because archaeologists have excavated that site. They dug up that site, and they've concluded to almost a certain degree that this is the house where Peter lived. You can find pictures of it online. Go Google when you leave here, Peter's house in Capernaum. Don't do it right now. Peter's house in Capernaum, and you will see pictures of what many believed is the house of Peter, and it's where the early church worshipped together as a congregation. There's devotional writings written on the wall. And the reason this is important is because the Bible is not a fairy tale. The Bible is truth. The Bible is set within a historical context. It has records of real life people like Peter, James, and John, and Jesus. So when Mark talks about Jesus healing people, raising the dead, and casting out demons... These are all historical events that have been recorded. And the people that are recording these events went to their death telling these stories. And I don't know about you, but I would not die for a lie. And it's just further evidence that when Christ claims to be God's son and the only hope for salvation, he's telling you the truth. And back to the story here. Look at verse 30. It says, now Simon's mother-in-law, that's Peter... Peter's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. Any of you have a, a Roman Catholic background, you know that Roman Catholicism believes that Peter was the first pope, and clergy within the Roman Catholicism, Catholic system, are not allowed to have wives, and they believe that every pope, all going all the way back to Peter, was not married in line with that principle. But here we see that Peter had a mother-in-law. Peter was married, and Peter actually took his wife along with him, according to 1 Corinthians 9, along ministry trips. It's just a point to say that whatever you believe about God needs to come from the Bible. Some of you have come in here with a, a background and a lot of ideas. What you need to do is, is not just shelve those ideas, but test those ideas according to the Scriptures. Whatever you believe, some of you have come from a lot of recovery backgrounds and in recovery meetings where they teach a lot of spiritual principles, and that's okay. But some of those spiritual principles you've learned are not right. And you need to take those ideas that you've learned and test them according to the Bible because the Bible is God's revealed word. It is our source of truth. And anything you find that contradicts Scripture is not true. I'm going to go back to the word here. So Peter, he's invited Jesus over for a meal, but he also has a hidden agenda here. His mother-in-law is sick, and he wants Jesus to heal his mother-in-law. That's why it says immediately they told Jesus about her. If you look at Luke's account of this story, Luke says she has a high fever. So she's probably got a terrible infection. She might be near death. She's probably older. She's really sick. And Jesus goes on to heal her. But I want you to notice something here. This is really important for your recovery. What did Peter do when he had a problem? took it to Jesus, didn't he? He immediately took that problem directly to Jesus. He didn't try to solve the problem himself. He didn't keep it to himself as so many of us do. He took that problem directly to Christ. And listen, I know many of you are in the midst of doing your fourth and fifth steps right now. Let me encourage you to not hold any of your problems, any of your sins back, but to take them to Christ. You have things in your background that you're afraid to talk about, you're, you're afraid to bring up. Maybe you're early on in this program and you're, you're afraid to talk in the meetings. Let me encourage you, don't hold back taking things to your brothers and sisters in Christ and to Christ himself. There's an old hymn called, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And one of the lines goes like this. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. And listen to this. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. 
will you be like Peter and take your burdens to Christ tonight? Will you be like Peter and stop holding them to yourself and take your concerns to Jesus? Because listen, he cares for you. He truly does. He cares for your soul. And he cares for Peter's mother-in-law. Verse 31, he came and took her by the hand, lifted her up, and the high fever, the fever left her and she began to serve them. So Jesus, he heals this woman instantly. Takes her by the hand, lifts her up, makes her well. It's not a process, it was instantaneous. And what he's demonstrating is the power of Christ to heal. And before we move on, let me just take a moment to say something about healing because this is very relevant today to probably what many of you see all the time. First of all, when it comes to healing, God is sovereign over everyone's health, over everyone's life, everyone's death. If God chooses to heal someone, he most certainly can. God can choose to heal anyone he desires. That's his right. But if he doesn't choose to heal someone, that is his divine prerogative. He reserves that right as God. And so here's what I want you to understand. Don't fall into the thinking that if I just have enough faith, God will heal me. Or maybe my loved ones weren't healed because they didn't have enough faith or I didn't have enough faith or maybe we didn't pray enough. How many of you have ever felt like that? I just didn't believe enough and that's, that's why God didn't heal. Listen, the people coming to Jesus from this entire town, most of them, if not all of them, are unbelievers. Let me say it again. The people coming to Jesus from Capernaum, which you're going to see in a moment, the whole town got healed. Everyone who was sick. They are unbelievers, most of them. They don't have faith, and Jesus healed them. What that shows you is God is sovereign over healing. So don't fall into the lie that if I just have enough faith, God will heal me. No, God will heal you if he chooses to. If he chooses to. My mother had more faith than anyone I've ever known. She was one of the strongest Christian women I've ever met. And she got diagnosed with cancer at the age of 41. And we prayed and prayed and prayed for her healing. The church came to our home and put their, their hands on her, anointed her with oil, prayed for her healing, and she died. Is it because she didn't have enough faith? Is it because we didn't have enough faith? Or is it because God is sovereign over those who are sick? And listen, I'm not mad that my mom didn't get healed because not only is God sovereign, God is good and he's wise. And his plans are far better than what I could dream up. So don't fall into that, well, if I just have enough faith, maybe they'll get healed. The second thing I want to say to you is many of you probably on TV or maybe even been to churches and you see these so-called faith healers, people who say they have the gift of healing. I want you to know that those people, most of them, are fakes. They are frauds. They are liars. And they should not be believed. And let me just say why. First of all, if God wants to heal someone through your prayers, he most certainly can do that. If God wants to heal someone through the laying on of hands, the anointing of oil, like James says, he can most certainly do that. But if someone comes to you and says, God has given me the gift of healing, you need to run. Because if they truly have the gift of healing, listen, then you need to know that they should go to St. Jude's Hospital and heal every child who's sick. If they have the gift of healing, they need to go to a third world country like the Philippines and heal people who are dying every single day of simple diseases like diarrhea. When someone tells you that they have the gift of healing... You need to ask them to start healing every single sick person who's around you. God can heal whomever he chooses. But don't be fooled by people who are just trying to get your money and acclaim. The purposes of the healing in the Bible were to validate the gospel in the person of Christ. That's why you see healings from the apostles and Christ himself. is because the Bible is validating who Jesus is. All right, rant over. Look at verse 31. Take notice of Peter's mother-in-law. Look how she responds. As soon as, as soon as she gets healed, what does she do? Gets up and serves. What a picture of the Christian life, right? Jesus enters our lives, heals us. 
of our sinfulness, heals us of our crazy thinking and way of living. And what do we do? We, we serve him. And this is so important for our recovery because we have taken so much from other people. It's time for us to serve the Lord and give back to the Lord. That's what this woman did. And on this night, there's probably tons of people. Into the morning hours, Jesus is healing us. It's verse 32. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Once word got out about Jesus' ability to heal, the whole town came. You can't blame them. I would too. But here's something I want to point out to you. Most of these people did not come to Jesus because they wanted Jesus. They did not come to the Lord because they wanted forgiveness or relationship with God. You know why they came? They wanted healing. They wanted their leg to be healed. They, they wanted their leg to be healed. They wanted their back to be healed. They wanted their cough to go away. They wanted their dead loved ones to be raised. They wanted demons to be cast out. And listen, you can get into recovery and you can seek God for good things. Sobriety, jobs, health, relationships. And those are all good things. But if you're seeking God for the things he can give you and not God himself, then you're missing it. If you're seeking what God can give you and not seeking God himself, then you're missing the entire point of recovery. Because what good will it be if you have sobriety and good health and jobs and relationships but don't know Christ? What good is that? In doing so, we're no different than the people that came to Jesus on this night. They don't want eternal life. They don't want God. They just want their pain to go away. And Jesus is gracious enough to help you. Jesus is gracious enough to give you good gifts, even if you don't love him. Even if you don't serve him. Even if you don't bow the knee to him. He is so kind and so benevolent and so loving. He will pour out his grace on his enemies. But if you fail to treasure and love Christ, then you are missing the very purpose for which we are created. Jesus, it says in verse 34, he healed many who were sick with various diseases, cast out many demons. You know, what struck me here is he could have healed everyone with just a word. Healed the whole town, got to bed early, but he didn't. One by one, he treated these people. And it just shows you the compassion and how much Christ personally cares for individuals. With the word, he could have taken care of every single person and not met with any of them. And they would have been satisfied, but Jesus wanted to take them one by one by one because he cares for you. He cares for you. Whether you realize that tonight or believe that tonight, Jesus cares and loves you. He desires for you to know him. He wants you to know him personally. He doesn't just want you to know things about him. Look at verse, the end of verse 34, and this is where we're close says, he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. We talked about his authority over Satan and demons last week. We see it here once again. Remember, he cast the man who had the demon and he cast him out of that man, wouldn't permit that demon to speak. And here's what I want you to see. This demon knows Jesus. He knows who he is. The devil knows who Jesus is. The devil believes all the right things. The devil believes and understands that the Bible is the word of God. He believes and understands that Jesus died and rose again. He understands that Jesus is going to return and have final victory. But here's the disconnect is he doesn't know, love, and trust Jesus in a salvific way. There's a difference between knowing about Jesus and actually knowing Jesus. And tonight, listen, I want you to understand that Jesus wants you to know him. He doesn't just want you to know about him. Jesus wants you to be in a personal, intimate relationship with him. That is why he came. He came so that he might die on the cross for sinners, so that he could take away the barrier that stands between you and God and bring you into fellowship with God. And he has given you every reason to trust him tonight. Has he not been good to you? Has he not blessed you and helped you? And given you guidance and grace. He has given you every purpose to follow and trust him. And he's given every proof that he is Lord. Namely that God raised him from the dead. 
So let's, let's pray together tonight. Let's, let's bow our heads and let's just, let's ask God to, to help us. Help us to see Jesus rightly. Help us to go from knowing about him to knowing him personally. Let's do that now. Father, we're thankful for the Christ of Scripture. We're thankful that you have revealed yourself in your Son. Lord, we pray that we would go from knowing about him to having a personal relationship with him, knowing him truly. Father, I pray that no one in here would be deceived by false teachers, men, women who desire nothing but praise for their own names. I pray, Lord, that every man and woman here would be filled with your truth, that you would give them the ability to discern what is true from error so that they would follow you rightly, that they would not be deceived by the things of the world, the things of Satan. I pray, Lord, that we would come to know you, not just to receive what you can give us, but to receive you, to know and treasure you. I pray for each individual's sobriety in here tonight, that you would lead them away from temptation. If they're thinking about going into relationships or the pursuit of money or pursuit of possessions or maybe leaving the recovery structures they have now because they think that they're ready, but they're not, Lord. I pray that you just give them grace and contentment where they are so that they continue to build their relationship with you and to press deeper into this life of recovery. And most of all, Lord, I pray for the salvation of those who are lost tonight. I pray that you would open their hearts and their minds that they might trust you as Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.